I'm Robert McBride, and this is Everyday People, a program in which we investigate the lives of people making a difference in our community. Good afternoon, this is Robert McBride with another episode of Everyday People, talking to people that make a difference in our community. Today we are lucky to have with us from the northern part of the state, Lars Torres, who has been a partner in crime around creative economy issues and stuff for a number of years. So welcome to the program. Hey, thank you, Robert. It's yeah, a pleasure. What yeah, a treat. It's great. So um, I'm just going to read a little quick couple of sentences that Lars because it really sums up and then we're going to kind of delve into some of these things he's mentioned that he's been involved in. Right. So Lars is an artist, a writer, an educator who is passionate about Vermont's creative economy. He is involved with the Vermont Creative Network and the Green Mountain Film Festival. He's the founder of Local 64, a co-working space in Montpelier mm -hmm. and the Backpacker Guide to Creativity in Vermont. So that's it, man. There's a lot there. Whew, what do we yeah. got a half hour? I don't know. What do you, how would you like to evolve the discussion? Would you, do we want to go through the way you listed them? Do you want to? Uh, What's top of mind for you? What's ripe in Bellows Fall? Well, I, I want to hear well, how I, I can help. Know. Well, we, I basically kind of called you up because I hadn't seen you in a while. Yeah. And uh, we've both been involved with the Creative Vermont Creative Network, yeah. and, which is a, um, an initiative through the Vermont Arts Council and before that based on creative economy initiatives yeah. and stuff. And so I wanted to kind of bring you down to our region and kind of, you know, talk to you a little bit about what we're doing. Our region includes Wyndham County and Bennington. Yeah. And there's seven zones in the state of Vermont and we are the Southern zone. And so, well, okay, what is your relationship to the Vermont Creative Network? Like you, I serve on the, um, on the board there, the Vermont Creative Network Steering Committee, I think right. they call it, right? right. And, um, you know, I sort of listen for Washington County, but I do feel so enlivened by the things that are happening around the state. I think mm -hmm. I bring a, maybe a, 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 a unique cut to this work because I'm particularly interested in digital media, the digital arts and sciences, right? Um, but also in how innovation informs creativity. And so you can't get away from it in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I look forward to bringing that voice into a form that I think is a little bit more used to hearing about the plastic arts, you know, traditional three-dimensional mm -hmm. arts, sculpture, mm -hmm. um, the performing arts, ballet, and, you know, literary arts like um, poetry and things like this. So right. um, I like to find out how can those forms be stretched, complemented, augmented through emerging technologies. So what, uh, what are some of the challenges and opportunities in Vermont around the digital? Around the digital? One of the biggest is, um, that I hear about, right, is, um, is access to production resources. Um, you know, if, if say you wanted to um, make a very small feature, a $2 million feature or something like that, you're still hampered by getting some of that equipment and some of the talent into the state to actually make your production, right? There are resources like Urban Rhino Productions up in Burlington, there are pockets here and there, but by and large, they would be tapped out if you say had three or four simultaneous um, productions in the state. So that's the first one. I think the second one is then distribution, right? Um, we don't, well actually we now have ITV Fest, which is in Manchester, that really seeks to be kind of a first look festival for buyers, um, mm -hmm. for distribution. So we're starting to evolve, but that's been a traditional challenge. Um, if you've made yourself a short or you've got a web series, right. how do you get eyeballs on it? Right. We don't necessarily have those networks professionally for you to tap into. So those are growing and they're huge opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and where does like Vermont fit in with the rest of the country or the world in, in some of this? Does it kind of carry its unique brand forward like mm. Vermont seems to be able to do in so many ways? Yeah. Or is there... That's a good question. I can sort of take my cut on it. Sure. Um, well, it'd be what you're fun here for. if that's folks what you're call in and <laughs> I don't know how it works in your show, but really engage around it. So I, I feel like we're, we're sort of between the um, salt water and the fresh water, you know, we sort of get this um, sort of nexus, this washing together of different cultures. So you get a lot of folks up from Brooklyn or, you know, they want to kind of leave the pace of that world behind, mm -hmm. start anew, but culturally their disposition is still very mm -hmm. much, you know, related to big ideas um, and, um, you know, sort of 
transformational art, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then, then I think we've got um, folks who like being isolated up here and thrive on that sense of, you know, tradition and on that sense of, um, you know, the, 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 the older ways, whether that's farming or the crafts, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're at a wonderful place where those two um, kind of cultures push against each other a lot um, and produce new and I think funky voices as a result. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we're at a really exciting place. I'd love to see us, um, you know, pushing even further up into say Montreal as a market and how does trying to sell mm -hmm. artwork in Montreal influence our voice as a mm -hmm. result, right? Um, so I think we're at a wonderful place. Um, when it comes to digital technologies, um, you know, it's funny, I was watching, I don't know if you know the guys who have um, South, South 802, SO802, it's a studio no. in, uh, in uh, Springfield, uh, DJ Vezzi and, um, and some of his friends, they, um, they make some great rap music, um, but they give it this sort of rural spin that's a lot of fun, you know, um, and they're telling stories, you know, about, you know, being, being ex-cons or whatever, and um, just kind of telling country life from their perspective, right. but with a very sophisticated understanding of how to leverage social medias to get views, which, you know, when you figure that out, then the advertising dollars follow. So mm. they're doing some great work up in Springfield, and it's nice to see them kind of hold a center um, between the new technologies, but a very vernacular culture. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That, that sounds interesting. I'll yeah, have to a lot of fun. check them out. Maybe they want to be so on the program. To invite them in. I'm yeah. sure they would love to be. <laughs> okay. Do a live I'll studio session. I'll follow up with you about that, definitely. Right. Cool. So tell us a little bit about the what you founded, though, the Local 64. Yeah, so that was about five years ago. Okay. Uh, we're, in our, we're in our sixth year now. And um, at the time, I was doing a lot of web development and um, was kind of doing it isolation. And so I looked to co-working, which I had actually been introduced to in South Africa. I was traveling from Botswana to uh, Johannesburg. And some young people picked me up in the car, and we started talking. They were spinning off this big vision that they had back in 2002 about creating a co-working mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. in Johannesburg. I never heard of co-working before. Um, I came away from that kind of like always in the back of my head. Oh, that's a tool. Wonder mm. when I'll need it, right? right. So come, um, what was it, 2012, um, I was really looking around for a place where I could work, but without taking up seats in a coffee shop or something like mm -hmm. that. And there wasn't any option like that in Montpelier. So myself, a game designer, Edmar Mendizabal, a communications professional, Matisse, um, Bustos Hawks, we sort of threw in together and said, let's um, you know, create a co-working space. And they really helped. I, front of the business side, but they really help build momentum, a story, mm -hmm. help draw people in and market the thing. Mm -hmm. So we've been running there. We have about 20 members, so it's a small, relatively small right. co-working space. Um, we have uh, six office areas. They're shared by artists, designers, architects, game designers, um, and then we have sort of this nomadic situation where you can just come and get a desk for a day, mm -hmm. um, nick off the good Wi-Fi, have some coffee, and yeah. get some work done. So, so is that kind of... Um, I mean, you started it based on an idea that you, you know, collaborating and stuff. Yeah. So is that kind of, you know, evolved just kind of naturally? Or if you said, if I was going to reset up the space, what I know now, would there be different things you do? Or it's just mm. the nature of what it is is the nature of what it is. And A it little works. bit of both. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, so one of the things, there's different um, aspects to the business model, as you'll know, that make it successful. And some of them I just can't get rid of. Like, it'd be great to own my own building. In that case, lots of different problems would go away. I could have uh, greater latitude on certain things. But I'm renting from a landlord who's been terrific, and it just limits um, a certain amount of um, elasticity in the business model mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's that. But in terms of actually feeding people, right, the hearts and souls of the people who work there, uh, it's just a lot of listening and then, oh, okay, well, let's try to pivot around in this direction, mm -hmm. pivot around in this direction. I've been um, holding down full-time jobs for a while, and so it's been hard to be a lead on organizing community events and things, which, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's the lifeblood of any yeah. endeavor is bringing yeah. people together, celebrating them, and the ideas that, you know, uh, we could be working on together, uh, whether that's celebrating through food, through, you know, TED-style talks, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the mechanisms mm -hmm. are. Um, so I think in the next year, uh, we'll be dedicating more resources to kind of making these events happen for the community because they're also a great opportunity for folks who use the space to share their ideas with a larger community. 
Um, so we'll be, we'll be trying to do more of that. Um, there are now, I think at last count, 14 co-working spaces around Vermont. Wow. When I started, there were two. And with that sort of flourishing are many styles, approaches, scales, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so there's more options for people to kind of find um, their, their niche or, or a co-working space that'll work for them. Mm -hmm. um, a few of us have thrown in together and said, if you're a member at one, say the Optimist Center in, um, in uh, Woodstock, then you can also use Local 64 in Montpelier for oh, free. Oh, cool. And really the goal there is to encourage curiosity and mm -hmm. look, if you can work anywhere, why not work anywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Encourage this open mentality to discovering what uh -huh. the state has to offer. Oh, that's so great. we're trying to do that with the passport. That's great. Yeah. So what, 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 what is like one of the largest centers? How many people would that incorporate or oh, space yeah. or something? So one of the largest is VSET, the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies up in Burlington. Okay. They have a little bit of a tech focus, um, incubating um, technology-based companies, a lot of data-driven companies, software builders. Um, they, boy, you know, you'd have to ask David Bradbury for the exact number, but if I had to spitball, I'd say they have probably about 120 members. Oh. Um, and, you know, they're able to keep their um, costs down um, and their profits quite high, thanks to, I think, a really good relationship with Verizon, who owns the uh, building that, mm -hmm. they, that they lease from. Yeah, so I think um, if, you, if, if somebody's interested in creating a co-working space, right, um, finding a property owner who really believes in your value proposition because a you're making the state more friendly to techies and they right. need to hire techies great right. there's a natural synergy yep. there, right yep. find those hooks yep. Yep. and then pitch it to the right property owner right. who wants to see that part of vermont's economy really grow mm -hmm. and co-working is a great way to do that yeah wow, that's great yeah. <laughs> that sounds it's great fun. it's a and it is it's great to be working at, or have access to people when working in a space i might liken it to like mm. uh, artists you know when i you know was in new york you know there's an artist studio space and there were probably 10 artists working in the building and you sort of knew they were around or not around you had someone to bounce off of but if you need to just go into your own studio yeah. and get what you needed done too you know it's that kind right. of environment instead of a cup of sugar you need a cup of turpentine yeah exactly yeah, yeah let me borrow a brush sure you know? all right exactly. yeah well in the trading of skills happens yes. a lot yes. in these spaces. Yeah. Can I get your eye on this U UX design here I'm yeah. working on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's terrific, that's terrific. So, and then you've got this, I think we'll talk about the Green Mountain Festival because that will be coming up. It and is, that's a yeah. film festival yeah. in Montpelier. Yes. And it's been running how long now? Boy, I want to say this is the 20 something year, boy, don't quote me on it. Mm -hmm. um, when was, so it was 1968. So where does that put us at about the 50? Yeah, 60 as well. 50 We're coming years? up on the 68, 78, is it 80, possible? 98, 80, yeah, 50 years. So, wow. That might, I might be mixing up how old the festival is with how old the particular film is. Mm -hmm. um, boy, but Rick and Andrea started it, mm -hmm. um, and it might have been 50 years ago. That feels an awful long time ago. Um, but anyways, it's a wonderful film festival um, that happens at a couple of venues in Montpelier. It'll be March 16th through okay. the 25th. Okay. And this year it has a new director, Karen Dillon, who's a filmmaker and educator um, who's come over from overseas, and she's doing just an incredible job. So I was really excited to be able to help out and, and do what I could do to make sure this thing thrives. Yeah. Under so so what, are the, the, what are the other alternate... The different venues. locations of venues it goes between. Yeah, so the Savoy Theater now has two floors. Oh, okay. So there's an upstairs and a downstairs. Okay. So they use both of those venues. Um, and then there is, um, there, there's been traditionally the pavilion, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the governor's yep. executive building. And then in, um, in the uh, uh, city hall. Um, oh, in the okay. Lost Nation Theater. Yep, yep. Now, I don't know which of those they're using this year and which will be programmed, but that's mm -hmm. been the traditional setup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, the, and the, it goes, the festival lasts how long? And how uh, many? It's 10 days. 10 days. Yeah. And how many films are they going to be? That's a great question. This year, I think there are, across all the categories, um, which are animation, uh, feature narrative, and documentary, with um, a program on short films and then a program on local filmmakers. If you added those all together, there's probably slightly more than 100 films, say mm -hmm. 110, something like right. that. Yeah, so it's a densely, densely yeah. packed uh, week for cinephiles. Wow. For sure. And so what do you do? You just buy a ticket to each individual uh, film or can yeah. you get a, a pass or what? All can of that, yes. Really? Yeah. The best deal, honestly, if you love film and you're willing to just kind of come up for a while, is um, the full Monty, mm -hmm. right? So get that picture in your head. 
Um, the full Monty, uh, which gets you access to any film you want. You just have to do. You do have to get online and reserve a right. ticket because yeah. the seats will fill up. Right, right, right. So as long as you're willing to do the work to, you know, figure that figure out where you're going to be, out, then you're good. Yeah, yeah. And then you can also get like a ten pack or something yeah. like that, and they're incentivized, so you get good discounts. Right. If, so how does someone find out? Do you know? Can yeah. you tell us the web page? Can yes. you share the web page with our audience? I would love to. Yeah, okay. it's gmffestival.com. Mm -hmm. So Green Mountain Film Festival dot com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's an exciting time. And um, in particular, folks should come and look at the um, Vermont Filmmakers Showcase because this is an area that, you know, Vermont knows how to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And getting, um, getting those stories on film out into the world is okay. a big thing for us. And do a lot of the films have uh, maybe a little introduction as the filmmaker there or not, yeah. sort of question answer after you're pretty much just showing the film and moving on? That's a great question. It's, we're going to have a really robust program this year. One of the things that's, so there's a couple of things that are exciting. So yes, there will be some just, you know, say that film was made in Argentina. Yep. Yeah, we'll Boom. just show the film. Okay. But there will be some films, you know, might have been made in New York or something like this, mm -hmm. where the director or the writer or the editor, someone intimately involved in that film is available to come up and do a talk. Mm -hmm. And so some of them will um, be films with workshops. So one of my favorites is, um, it's, um, it's called Mortified, mm -hmm. and it's a series of short films by this woman. I'm not going to remember her name, but they're fantastically awkward stories about sexuality mm -hmm. and coming into your sexual awareness. Mm -hmm. So she's going to do a set of workshops about, you know, how do you get that out of your actors to make that mm -hmm. feel so fresh and authentic? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and then journaling tactics you know, techniques so you are building up your own body of work if you want to tell those stories at some point. It's a cleverly made film that combines animation, um, direct narrative, some reenactment, so mm -hmm. it's, it's got it all. So mm -hmm. that's going to be an amazing workshop, so yeah. she'll actually be giving hands-on workshops. Um, and then Karen has set up, because she's a new director this year, trying to change things up a little bit, what she calls film to table. Okay. So in a few great. cases, um, like take the film Ramen Heads. It's a great sort of you know, uh, documentary about um, the, the, mm, the movement around ramen yep. that's happening, thanks in part to David Chang down there at Momofuku. Yeah. Um, but anyways, um, they will show that film, and then with the director or, again, someone intimately involved in the film, you can decamp to, say, Three Penny, have a bowl of ramen, talk about umami and what that means to the experience, <laughs> and uh, just sort of have the full the full experience. Yeah. So it's going to be amazing. She's doing a great, great job putting oh, things together. That's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. So put it on your calendar. I will. I All will. Right. I'll have to go home and Google it, man. <laughs> yeah. Give us that website one more time. Yeah, happy to. It's GMF. Right. Festival. Okay. Dot com. Great. So, yeah. Great, great. And, this, and there's a series of different, you know, I've been great about tracking the film festivals mm -hmm. throughout Vermont, but I know that yeah. they do the, I, I just got a, a thing across my email from the uh, White River Junction, the Indie Film Festival, I believe, yeah. is coming up. I don't know if that's in March or April. I haven't had a chance to open and look it up. Yeah. And then you were mentioning some others to me that if people are really cinematic, like uh, there's one in Middlebury? There is, is, yeah, the Middlebury New Filmmakers Festival, okay. which is started by uh, Vermont filmmaker Jay Craven, okay. along with a former Disney exec. Um, they've gone in together to create just a really outstanding program. It's now in its third year, I think, mm -hmm. of um, new works, which are always exciting to see new voices entering right. cinema. And when does that generally take That's place near? Kind of, is that like in hmm. the summer or...? I'm not going to recall. Okay. Something in my head says it's fall, mm -hmm. September, October. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what others are on your radar? Screen? On the radar? The Burlington, there must be a... Yeah, there is. Um, so you mentioned um, the White River Indie Film Festival, which happens in June. Um, what's neat about that is they're also looking at what they call transmedia which is kind of where um, the structured linear filmmaking approach, um, you can experiment with it now with, with new technology. You can almost choose your own adventure mm -hmm. when it comes to a film. So jump around in the narrative, mm. um, and how do, how do tools like VR now affect storytelling? So transmedia is just really looking at this nexus of technology and storytelling, and how can we do it differently, more exciting, mm. create more empathy and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I think, um, and this, this weekend or next weekend, they're showing the film with JR, the French artist. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, Faces and Places is okay. a documentary. Okay. Um, and it's just a wonderful opportunity to travel around France with a young filmmaker and Agnes, I'm not going to remember her last name, an older French filmmaker. The one filmmaker. that did the gleaning. Um, yeah, I think yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. yeah. 
Yes. Um, so they're traveling around France talking about art, um, talking about you know a young artist coming up, building a movement around portrait photography. It's a beautiful film. So um, okay, and that's called what again? I have faces, faces and Places, I believe. Oh, that's, yeah. that sounds great. Yeah. And that's also going to be playing at the um, as part of the monthly film series of the Vermont International Film Festival, okay. which is in Burlington. I believe that happens in October of every year. Mm -hmm. And Orly Yadin, who runs that, is just putting together every year a stronger and stronger program of documentary films, feature films, animation, um, as well as local filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And it's just becoming a wonderful venue up there. Wow. Yeah. That, now that sounds really, really great, you know. That's what, you know, I'm always amazed. There's just so much to be doing in Vermont, you know. There's you wouldn't like, believe there's, it, right? Oh, I know. No, if you read so the New rich. Yorker, you wouldn't see all of this yeah, great yeah. stuff, right? I mean, it's so rich between that and music and this. <laughs> you know, there's you know, something true. to be done. You know, yeah. Course, read Vermont us, Life. Yeah, most of us like to go home and stay home at night and don't go back <laughs> out again. It's too cold. I'm not going out. But yeah. no, there's. I mean, there's just so much to. When I first moved up here from New York, I thought, oh, I don't know what it'll be like. It's like there is so much to do. Well, you've built you know? some of this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. thanks to you, we're. Um, enjoying so much yeah. of this. So. Well, it's, a great, it's a great place to live. Yeah. So this brings us to, um, I think this is one of your newer initiatives or is yeah. this something you've been working on for a while? The Backpacker Guide. The Backpacker to Guide. Creativity. Yeah, well in it's- Vermont, so. It's interesting, it's, um, it is a personal project. It's sort of a passion project in a way. Um, and it's in response to a need that I constantly came across whether I was working with the state in the Office of the Creative Economy or out in the world. Um, a couple of problems. One was um, the story that's being told about Vermont um, in the media, whether that's uh, on the web or in magazines, doesn't necessarily capture the aspiration and the mindset of a, a generation or two or more of creatives who really see the state as something um, other than just historic preservation mm -hmm. and um, you know seasonal recreation um, and agriculture, which, which are kind of the dominant stories about our state. Um, and so I'd been hearing that as a complaint for a while. The other piece was um, you know some folks with a lot of talent continuing to say that the state wasn't doing enough, you know, from a tourism and marketing perspective, from their web presence, whatever. And it's like, well, let's just build it. And there were a couple of half starts and false starts and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's a coordination problem. We're all so far away and all that. So anyways, I just um, had some time on my hands. So I decided to dive in and build what I thought um, could be elements of that narrative and then started reaching out to you and others to say, hey, help fill in the blanks here. You know, mm -hmm. what makes Vermont such a great state to create? Why are we all here as creatives? Mm -hmm. um, so trying to put that story together in a way that um, answers sort of two problems. One is the problem um, if you're visiting the state, right? Um, what are some of the things that are exciting that are happening around here that I can sort of dive into? Um, Woodstock used to have, for example, an incredible digital media festival. Um, I think it ran for five years and now it's wound down. Um, but that was, um, it was well attended, but it was not known. Mm -hmm. And how do we make these assets that the state has more visible so that the folks who are putting their lives into them um, have greater prospects for sustainability, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's one, one piece, is getting visibility um, of Vermont's great offerings to folks who are visiting the state. Maybe, maybe you're considering a move here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're considering bringing your startup here. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the case that this is the best place to build an app company, right? Mm -hmm. We can make that case, mm -hmm. but it's just not out there right now. Mm -hmm. and then the other piece is helping creatives to connect. Um, I talked to folks in Burlington who have no idea that the Upper Valley is a center of excellence in electronic publishing and things like this, GIS or software publishing. At the same time, um, I've actually had people tell me it is easier for them to hire a photographer in LA or New York than in Vermont for you know a sports shoot or something like that. And so the question is, wow, well, how can we help connect more of our creatives so we're building our own internal economy mm -hmm. um, and keeping the resources circulating a little bit more? And is that something like just because they have a connection to those people, you know, and so it's easier to, or well, there's ad agencies and there's talent agencies, right? There's right. a whole infrastructure right, 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 to right. help take Robert McBride's craft and your mm -hmm. talent and, and make it visible to the world. Mm -hmm. We don't have um, that mm -hmm. kind of infrastructure up mm -hmm. here to make talent visible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you wanted to spend your time um, you know, going through NIFA, the New England Foundation for the Arts, through their database, mm -hmm. you could probably find that kind of stuff. But it's, 
um, not a visible and sort of industry um, friendly tool. It's more mm -hmm. of a research kind of tool. So we've got them, but they're just packaged maybe in ways that don't quite speak to people um, in the industry who need mm -hmm. who need that access. So are you thinking that we need to replicate that or we need to just create communication that uh, we use those outside resources for certain things and then we sort of make what our resources are known? I mean, yeah, you know, it's kind of like the whole education problem. You know, we obviously don't want to, we can't afford to create colleges and colleges and colleges to meet different needs that other colleges already exist serve. So, you know, the idea is you go to that college and then you either decide you're coming back to Vermont or doing something. Mm -hmm. So is it is it kind of an import-export kind of thing that gets more going or is it? Yeah. So I think the biggest, the biggest challenge is what's the story that's being told, okay. right? I don't know that NIFA owns the Vermont story. We have to own it. New England Foundation of the Arts that has right. that database, right? Yeah. So they're not going to tell our story. We have to shape it. We have to give it meaning for people in the film industry or the game design industry or whatever. We mm -hmm. have to say Vermont has something to offer. Mm -hmm. We have to shape that. And then from there, you know, the way the site that I'm building is, is organized is around crafting that narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and there's two ways to access the narrative. One is through geography. You talked earlier about those creative zo zones in Vermont, the mm -hmm. six zones. Mm -hmm. So we'll use that. Mm -hmm. We're not replicating some new schema. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to use that zone. So if, for example, you know you're going to be skiing in Kill Killington, what's around you? You know, mm -hmm. what's exciting um, that you might want to explore um, as a creative who's kind of looking to um, get your hands dirty? Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is by sector, right? I'm a painter and I want to find out who's doing digital painting in Vermont or mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a sculptor and I want to find out who's casting um, you know bronze in Vermont or something like that um, so we'll organize by sector and within that then we'll have a little narrative that says here's the legacy and then we'll be able to direct people straight to the social hooks of people who have an online presence mm -hmm. and who can tell a part of that story so mm -hmm. the goal is to connect to people uh, not so much the searchable faceless repository of data, mm -hmm. right? If at the end of the conversation it makes sense, oh yeah, but you know, you really should, you know, keep your research. If you're writing a book or a report or something, you know, keep using that tool over there. But the goal is to connect um, people to people mm -hmm. because that's at the end of the day what I've found has really inspired me to take any major action in my life. Mm -hmm. It's not been a database, it's been a conversation with mm -hmm. a person like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to foster those connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or it's like a ride in your car in South Africa that that's exactly gave you right. the idea. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Got filed away somewhere, and it finally was like right. you know pushed. So what were you doing in Africa, South Africa? I used to work in the field of um, sort of democratic governance, uh -huh. and um, so I was down there as a researcher, and um, um, I was I'd been at a conference in Botswana mm -hmm. um, centered on local governance reform mm -hmm. because Botswana at the time was really a quite a leader in a number of ways, particularly youth engagement, mm -hmm. which is something I'm particularly passionate about. So anyways, at their at that conference um, and then um, just decided to hitch a ride on my way back rather yeah, than a great, great. bus or an airplane, just see a little of the landscape. <laughs> hey, great. when you're there, yeah. seize the opportunity, yes, yeah. right? So, yeah. you know, we're so lucky to have like, you know, a resource, you know, a person like you that's been intrigued by Vermont and moved here. So how did you end up in Vermont? I mean, what were that's some of the question. choices out there? Was it right? a serendipitous kind of thing? Like with me, it was total serendipity how I ended up here. But yeah, what was happening that you suddenly like, I, I, huh. I ended up in Vermont? So it was a little bit of serendipity, and it was also kind of that time in your life where you're open to, mm -hmm. um, to change, right? Mm -hmm. So what, um, what had happened was um, I'd been at the University of Southern California. Okay. I was studying film and international relations. Mm -hmm. I, took a, um, I took a semester in Washington, D.C. to really kind of get down and dirty with public relations, mm -hmm. and it was the Clinton-Gore election that year. Okay. So I was, you know, had my head all surrounded by that. But I fell in love with DC. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of history that was mm -hmm. there, the cultural resources that are mm -hmm. there, and so I decided to stay. Um, I quit, dropped out of school, um, enrolled in the Corcoran School of Art, mm -hmm. and um, was studying uh, photography. At the time, you know, I'd been interested in film, and I thought, wow, well, maybe if I just focus on photography, I can really sort of become um, more conservative in the sense of better in my control of, of the media and use less of it. Um, after that, um, I don't know, art school didn't quite click. It was too much in isolation mm -hmm. from the academy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
My mom had sent a catalog for this school up in Vermont, this place called Brattleboro, which I'd never heard of. I don't even think I'd heard of Vermont at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, actually, that's not true because I had a friend who went to Breadloaf, um, mm -hmm. and so he had uh, been there. But um, I didn't know anything about Vermont. And there was a school, build your own major, basically, was what they were saying. So I was able to combine my interest in media studies with um, sort of, I don't know, international relations, if you will. Um, it was really more about international development, mm -hmm. but um, combined those two interests and um, went to school here. And it was when I sort of began to experience the compact nature of village and town life mm -hmm. and how much was, you know, squeezed into these vibrant little downtowns mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I became quite compelled um, with that footprint and uh, met my wife here. Mm -hmm. um, we went to D.C. after school for mm. about eight years and mm. um, had a kid in our last year in D.C. You know, you know how like everything can go wrong and sideways all at once? Mm -hmm. Sort of happened in D.C. Um, not in any personal reasons, but in sort of the neighborhood around us was mm -hmm. in a lot of change. And um, we thought that maybe this wasn't the best place to raise a little girl. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we knew we didn't want to be in the suburbs mm -hmm. and do the commute. Mm -hmm. The city wasn't looking affordable or tenable. So we said, mm -hmm. let's, what about Vermont? Let's go back to Vermont. <laughs> so we brought our then one-year-old daughter and uh, ourselves up to Montpelier. And we did uh, telecommuting for about, well, myself for about two years. I mm -hmm. had a job where I was in D.C. still and telecommuting. And then... Um, yeah, moved out to Cabot soon mm -hmm. after and did the rural life. Mm -hmm. Now we're back in Montpelier mm -hmm. and very happily so. Well, that's great. That's yeah. really great. Well, thank Sorry, you I'm for, winning. no, no, I think it's, you know, the stories are the most interesting. And I think, you know, uh, you know, we kind of forget the scale of Vermont allows us uh, to do so much, you know, because yeah. you have such a, a chance to, to meet with people and you have a chance to make a difference in your community. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, if just a lot more investment can be made in just that fact of what people are already doing yeah. or that it's known as a place that invests in people just kind of doing creativity whether they move on or not you know they're never going to forget that connection yeah. you know they're not going to you know because it was a place that allowed it to happen and i know it's one of those intangible intangibles that bureaucrats and legislators probably can't really rationalize but i just think that yeah. kind of investment always 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 pays back yeah you know? no i think you're so right and you know we can put whatever it is, $3 million to online advertising to try to get young people here. Mm -hmm. But I think if we create the context mm -hmm. in which young people can thrive, mm -hmm. we'll, do, we'll do fine. Mm -hmm. We'll do all the recruitment and all the retention we could dream of right. if we're building that context, which we aren't doing right now mm -hmm. as a state. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a lot more we can do, and I'd much rather see that $3 million go into youth programs. You mm -hmm. know? Um, so, you yeah. know, we'll see. But I think you... All of us together are pulling together this creative economy, right? And building the connections and hopefully the positions for young people where they can be in a leadership position on local community boards and things like that because it's, it's that kind of sense of ownership mm -hmm. that I think will breed the loyalty and um, the kind of connection you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is the only thing that's made our communities thrive. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. So, thank you. Yeah, I want to you know, get you back in a couple of months, see how the film festival went, what's okay. going on. Happy. How's the backpack you know, guide going? Okay. You know, and hopefully we can help impress that. And I'm going to you know, take Lars out of the studio and get him onto the square a little bit this afternoon. So mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you for participating. My pleasure, Robert. It. Thank and you. And you're always welcome in Bellows Falls and love to get up and see what you're doing. Please do. In your neck of the woods and make to some of that film festival. That yes, sounds absolutely. Great. You've inspired me yeah. to get out of Bellows Falls and see something else. You Job know? done. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so I want to uh, thank again FACT TV for allowing um, this great resource to exist where we can host programs, meet people, and all the great work they do down here in the community. I also want to thank the Vermont Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, Chroma Technology and First Life for helping to uh, support ramps so that we can do programming like this and other projects in the community. So till next time, adios, arrivederci. <laughs>